15, 2 says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. I don't know what your week's been like. It's been crazy if it's been good. But I encourage you to worship the Lord with us tonight. And just give whatever you have to the Lord, whether it's good or bad, and just worship with us tonight. Dear Lord, we just come before you. God, we thank you. God, that through any circumstance, whether good and bad, you're sovereign, God, you reign, Lord, and you care about every need that we have. Lord, I ask that you would be in the service tonight, God, that you would inhabit our praises. God, move, speak to our hearts, have your way in the service, in your name we pray, amen.
Praise the Lord. Can we give him some glory tonight? Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you for who you are. Lord, that we can know you, that we can be in covenant love relationship with you because of the finished work that you accomplished on Calvary, going to the cross, dying in our place, so that we might know you, Jesus. We can experience your glory. God, how amazing, how awesome you are. Lord, we thank you that, uh, Lord, we can... We can know you in the beauty of your holiness. We can know you in the splendor of your majesty, Lord God. We can experience your all-sufficiency, Lord, tonight as we put our faith in you. Lord, I just pray that you'll accept our praise and our worship as a sweet sound in your ear. Lord, we just pray that you'll speak to us, move among us, teach us by your Holy Spirit in this time of Bible study tonight. Let us leave different than we came because of how you would move by your Spirit. We just thank you for it. In Jesus' name. study that we've started on uh, Go Deeper, First and Second Timothy, and uh, that's going to be a verse-by-verse -verse study. We've covered an introduction in chapter 1 and the very first part of chapter 2, and tonight we're going to jump into the packets here in just a moment and look at chapter 2 of the, la the next two sections and uh, talk about God's will, talk about how Jesus is our mediator, and talk about truth in the verses that we look at tonight. But let's look at the chapter first and um, read the chapter. And then after we read the chapter and get the context, we're going to jump into our packets tonight. Uh, we're going to split this up. And uh, there's five of us tonight. So if each of us just read three verses, uh, I think we can cover the chapter. So I'll start us out. And then if some of the others who are here tonight can come up, we'll just read three verses each. And uh, we'll cover the chapter before we get into the packets. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting with verse 1. I exhort, therefore, uh, for that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all in authority, who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Right, so I'm going to read, Dad, do you want to read 4 through 6 for me, please? Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Right, so we're going to read 7 through 9, please. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided or gold or pearls or costly array. All right, Brianna, 10 through 12, please. But which becomes women professing godliness with good works, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to assert authority over the men, but to be in silence. All right, then Tanya 13 to 15. For Adam was first born, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. All right, I'm going to switch mics up. All right, so we have the chapter in context. Let's look at the packets tonight. Chapter 2, we covered verses 1 through 3. 
uh, last time we were together a couple weeks back, uh, talking about an exhortation. And verses four, or verse four talks about God's will. And so we want to uh, pick up there tonight and uh, we'll go through verse eight tonight. All right, so chapter two, God's will, verse four. Verse four, knowledge may also be translated rec recognition. True knowledge saves from error. Salvation, Christ died for all and his blood cleanseth from all sin. Thank God that it does, amen? It's not our efforts, it's Christ's sacrifice, his blood that cleanses us from all sin. God's will thus revealed is for all men to be saved. There's not the eyes of one person on this planet that you'll look into during your lifetime that God does not love enough that he sent his son to die for them. Amen? We need to remember that. And we look into some pretty wicked eyes sometimes. Some people who are mean and hateful. But there's not one set of eyes that we look into. A human being on this planet that God does not love enough that he sent his son Jesus to die for. And we need to remember that. And it doesn't mean we have to invite them into our home. Amen? We have to use wisdom. But we need to show people the love of Christ. And that's what will bring them to salvation is God's love getting a hold of them, all right? He wills that all be saved, but of course we know that all will not be saved simply because they refuse to be saved. To be saved, the will of the individual must match the will of God. Too many people want what they want, and it's not what God wants, right? And so they refuse God's redemption plan. Even though it's available to whosoever will, so many people want what they want, and that doesn't match up with what God wants. And so they don't end up receiving the salvation that's available to them. Completely shoots down the erroneous teaching of predestination, or pre-selection in predestination. There's, there's a couple of scriptures that talk about predestination, or being predestined. Romans 8 is one of them. But pre-selection in predestination is not mentioned in the Bible, it's unscriptural. And this claims that God has ordained from the beginning that some certain ones will be eternally lost, irrespective as to what they may or may not do, and some certain ones will be eternally saved, irrespective of what they may or may not do. And that's really pre-selection in predestination, and it's extreme. Uh, Calvinism. It's not uh, really in the scriptures and it, it takes what Calvin taught even further than Calvin took it himself. John 3 16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever. Aren't you thankful you're a part of the whosoever? Amen. You're saved. You're washed in the blood. And it's uh, whosoever will can come to Christ. The tenor of the scripture from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 is whosoever will. Right? It's not your birthright. It's not uh, what denomination you were brought up in. It's you choosing to accept God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. What he did for us at Calvary. That alone is how we receive salvation. The knowledge of the truth. The phrase, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, pertains to salvation through Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross and in his resurrection. Romans 6, Romans 10, John 3, 16 that we just read. Those are all passages that confirm that we need a knowledge of the truth. We need salvation. We need to know God experientially. Not just facts about Jesus. But having lived in covenant love relationship with Him, we know Him. Amen? Not just mere acquaintances or having some kind of mental assent that He is God. We need to have covenant love relationship. That's the knowledge that this is really talking about. What is truth? Truth isn't a philosophy. With philosophy actually being a search for truth. But which was never found and which cannot be found by that method. So the philosopher searches in vain. Alright, truth is not a philosophy, it is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us that in the Bible, John 14, 
Verse 6, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So truth is not a philosophy. It is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. If we're going to come to a knowledge of the truth, we have to know Jesus. How can we know Jesus? Only by way of the cross. Denying self, death to self, going the way that God says we must go. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So our source of truth ought to be the word of God. And that ought to be this book, the Bible. We ought to be looking for truth in a world that's chock full of error and corruption and wickedness and deception. It's in God's Word. 1 John 5, verse 6. This is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. All right? And in John 14 and John 16, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of truth, right? He will reveal truth to you. He will show you things to come. So if we want to know truth, we need to be exhibiting faith in Christ and Him crucified. We need to be in His Word and we need to be allowing the Holy Spirit to have an influence and an impact upon our lives every day. Alright? While there are many things which are true, that is altogether different from truth. Alright? The speed limit can change, right? When buildings go up around a big road, it may have been a 55 mile an hour speed limit, but when there's more traffic and more buildings, maybe residential neighborhoods a little bit closer to that main corridor, it was true maybe two years ago that the speed limit was 55, but if it changes because they changed the sign to 45, it's no longer true, right? Truth is not like that. Truth is foundational and it never changes because truth is a person Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. So foundational truth is what Jesus is all about, and that's what we need to have, a knowledge of the truth, the foundational truth of who Jesus is, what He's done for us, what His Word teaches us about Him. The knowledge of the truth is an ever-expanding work by the Holy Spirit within our hearts and lives. He's helping us to know Jesus more and more every day. Amen? He's teaching us about Christ and what He's done for us. If the believer has a proper understanding of the cross, then the great body of truth of the Word of God will begin to quickly unfold and will be understandable. We don't want to just read black and white letters on a page, be able to quote scriptures. We want to have the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to what these scriptures mean and how they apply to our lives, all right? A correct knowledge of the cross of Christ, which of course is the foundation of Christianity, gives one a proper perspective as it relates to the entirety of the Word of God and all that God does for redeemed humanity. We need to know and understand what Christ accomplished through His finished work. Alright? Alright, so chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Talked about God's will in verse 4. Verses 5 and 6 talk about one mediator. One mediator. Verse 5. We human beings are separated from God by sin. The word sin really means separation. So we're separated from God by sin and only one person in the universe is our mediator. And can stand between us and God and bring us together again. And that's Jesus who is both God and he is man. Jesus' sacrifice brought new life to all people. We don't have to live separated anymore, amen? We can be brought near. We can be brought back into harmony with God through Christ's sacrifice upon the cross, all right? Monotheism, the belief in one God, as opposed to polytheism, which is evident in many uh, Eastern religions, Monotheism, the belief in one God, is the basic premise of both Judaism and Christianity. But then comes a difference that we see in verses 5 and 6. For Christianity goes on to assert that there is one mediator between God and man, or God and men, the man, 
Christ Jesus. Right? We believe He is the Messiah. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. The basic meaning of mediator is one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship, or to form a compact, or for ratifying a covenant. That's what a mediator is needed for. Thayer says that Christ is called to be the mediator between God and men, since he interposed by his death and restored the harmony between God and man, which human sin had broken. He bridged the gap, amen, from a holy God to sinful men. Jesus bridged the gap. And we can have covenant love relationship because of our mediator, Jesus Christ, all right? Verse 6, in the first century, the simple Greek word litron or lutron was used for the ransom price paid to free a slave. So verse 6 tells us that Christ paid the ransom to free us from the slavery of sin. We were bound to sin, controlled, dominated by our sinful nature, but Christ paid our ransom to free us from the slavery of sin. Because of this, we are rightfully His possession. God owns us in two ways, doesn't He? He owns us because, number one, He's our Creator, right? He formed us of the dust of the ground and He breathed the breath of life into us. So we are God's possession because we are His creation. He made us. He formed us. We're also God's possession because of the price that Jesus paid to purchase us, to redeem us. The ransom to free us from our sins. And so we belong to the Lord. And we need to live our lives as if we belong to the Lord. Amen? Not live to ourselves or live for some other person or cause other than Christ. The ransom. Our Lord's death was a spontaneous and voluntary sacrifice on His part. It's not the Romans that took His life. It's not the Jews that took His life. They had a part in what happened, and they will be judged for it, and they were judged for it. But Jesus laid down his life as a sacrifice. As the song says, he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have stopped it all, but he knew voluntarily that he had to lay down his life for the sins of mankind to be forgiven. And he was willing to pay that ransom, all right? The great sacrifice. He yielded up himself to death as the price of the redemption of all mankind, his life in exchange for our forfeited lives. Right? For man to be delivered, and that means from our sins, which definitely enslaved humanity, the cross was an absolute necessity. Without the cross, we could not have been saved. Right? It wasn't his virgin birth. It wasn't his Christ-like example, as great as that was, that purchased our redemption. It was the cross and him going to the cross and dying that allowed us to be free from, from sin. So the cross was absolute necessity. From the ransom which had to be paid, we learn as to exactly how bad the, situa the situation really was and is. Sin is awful. It's deadly. It's horrific. It will cause death and decay and destruction in our lives. And the cross shows us that. The price to redeem us and free us from sin shows us how bad sin really was. And it is presently bad. Sin is destroying countries. It's destroying people and families, communities, at least for those who will not accept Christ. Sin is ravaging hearts and lives for those who who will not accept Christ. The remedy for sin is Jesus Christ, what he did at Calvary. But if we refuse that, we're going to experience the wages of sin, which is death. Inasmuch as the terrible sin debt is now paid by Jesus Christ, giving himself as a ransom, Satan has lost his legal claim on humanity, at least as it regards those who have accepted this, which Christ has done. Having no more legal claim, Satan has no choice but to let them go free. Because they now belong to God, having been purchased at great price. We don't want to have sin in our life because sin gives the devil a foothold. And the devil's never satisfied with a foothold in our life. He wants a stronghold 
in your life. If you're a believer who's been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary, why would you again open the door to Satan by sinning, by going back into sin and letting the enemy have a foothold, his foot in the door. Once he gets a foot in the door, he's coming in. And he wants to develop a stronghold. And so we need to keep our lives laid. Not only express faith one time for salvation to initially be justified, washed of our sins, but we need to maintain our faith in Christ and Him crucified so that the devil never gets a foothold and he never gets a stronghold in our life. He doesn't have a legal claim to us because we're in Christ. Amen. We need to stay in Christ because we're purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. In due time, the words in due time are the translation of the Greek kairos idios. The former word speaks of the critical epoch making periods foreordained of God when all that has been slowly and often without observation ripening through long ages becoming mature and come to birth in grand decisive events which constitute at once the close the close of one period and the commencement of another in due time this is God's timing how many know God's timing is not always it's rarely the same as our timing he's not bound by time like we are but in God's timing there's some epic making grand events that we can see that have happened in the Bible in due time Jesus came in due time in due time, God's going to uh, save us. He's going to wrap all of this up. He's going to fulfill His promises in our life. And so we need to understand what that due time is talking about. It's talking about God's timing, not ours. The due time would be that unique particular season for the proclamation of the gospel based upon the historic work of Christ on the cross. All right, This is the time we should be fulfilling the Great Commission. In God's timetable, that's what we should be doing in this due time that we're living in, this dispensation of grace. It's a time for going into all the world and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross is the means by which all victory is given to the child of God in our daily walk, which necessitates the believer evidencing faith on a constant basis in the finished work of Christ. All right? I, I believe in Christ and what He did for me at the cross for my justification. To wash me clean of all my guilty stains. To break the grip, the dominion, the power of sin over my life. That sin nature is dormant. It's reckoned as good as dead. And He's going to sanctify me. He's going to justify me, but He's also going to sanctify me. Make me a little bit more like Jesus every day. And soon and very soon, He's going to glorify me. There's going to be a trumpet that sounds. The rapture of the church is going to take place. And if we're alive and remain, we're going to receive a glorified body instantly. If we go by way of the grave, our, our spirit and soul is already in heaven. And we'll be given a glorified body at that moment as well. So either way, the end of our salvation will be realized as long as we keep a constant faith in the finished work of Christ. All grace comes through the cross, as does all of the great attributes of salvation, whatever those attributes might be. And so verses 5 and 6 is talking about that one mediator, Jesus Christ. He's our go-between. He's that bridge between a holy God and sinful man. He's the one that brought harmony uh, back to our covenant relationship with God. We can live in Christ, be free from sin, no longer a slave to sin. Satan has no more say-so in our lives because of one mediator, Jesus Christ. All right, verses 7 and 8 talks about truth. Verses 7 and 8, the uh, last two verses we're going to look at tonight, talk about truth. All right, let's go to the next slide. Verse 7, the word preacher in the Greek is charix, which means herald, and was used for a messenger vested with public authority who conveyed the official messages of kings, magistrates, princes, military commanders, or who gave a public summons or demand and performed various other duties. All right, they didn't have social media in the time when the Bible was written, right? And so in monarchies, that herald, that official uh, spokesperson for 
people in authority would go out to the street corner or to a prominent place in the market area and tell people, this is what the king says. This is the king's decree. This is what we're supposed to be as Christians. We're to be preachers of the gospel. We're, we're to be heralders of the good news. This is what the king of kings has to say. These are his decrees. These are his commandments. This is what his word says. We're to be those people in our, our day and age that we're living in, 2021, heralding the good news and uh, from the King of Kings. All right, in the New Testament, it signifies God's ambassadors, the herald or proclaimer of the divine word. God has revealed his word to you and giving you wisdom and understanding into it, not only for yourself, but for you to share it with others. God's word, Isaiah says, is supposed to be bread for the eater, right? That's for our consumption. But it's also supposed to be what? Seed for the sower, right? Put it in your pouch. Someone's going to come across your path that needs to hear the word of God, that God is making real in your own heart and in your own life. And that's what we're supposed to be as God's ambassador. So the preacher is one who makes a public proclamation for the king of kings. He is not to air his own opinions or debate other people's ideas, but proclaim the Word of God. We don't need preachers on a soapbox in 2021. Amen? We need preachers who've heard from God, who've heard a message from the King of Kings, and it's like fire shut up in their bones that they cannot help but speak. That's what we need in our day and age that we're living in the last days. All right? Paul says he's ordained a preacher. The word ordained in the Greek is tethimi, and it means to appoint. Preacher, as stated, refers to a herald, messenger, all right? His ordination was given to him strictly by the Lord Jesus Christ, which he knew in his heart, and which, of course, is the true ordination, and in fact, the only ordination that God fully recognizes. It doesn't matter if a denomination has recognized and ordained you as much as it does that God and the Holy Spirit have ordained you. And you can have a piece of paper that says somebody ordained you, but if God hasn't ordained you, that piece of paper means nothing. So we better understand that. That's what uh, Paul is talking about here. Apostle, the phrase, and an apostle, presents the highest calling of the fivefold ministry. Ephesians 4, verse 11, talks about the fivefold ministry. All apostles are preachers, but only a very few preachers are apostles. For the illustration, the fivefold ministry is like the hand, right? Pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, the other gifts. The apostle is the thumb, in the, if, the, if the hand is the fivefold ministry, and the thumb can touch all the other fingers very easily. So an apostle is someone who has a specific message, and we'll talk some more about what it is here. But they, they can be a pastor if they need to be. They can be a missionary. They can be an evangelist. They can be a teacher. They can do the other gifts, but they can do more than one. Whereas some other of the fivefold ministry, they're only they're very limited in the scope of their ministry. And so an apostle uh, is one uh, who can fulfill more than just the role of a messenger or a preacher. They can touch all the other gifts as well. All right. It is always to apostles that the Lord gives direction and revelation. Talking about for the New Testament church especially. It's apostles that God gave direction and revelation to. This direction and revelation may take the form of added light on a particular Bible doctrine. Or emphasis which the Holy Spirit desires. However, irrespective as to what is given, it will always and without fail coincide perfectly with the Word of God. The Apostle Paul was given the meaning of the New Covenant through the message of the cross, right? Brother Swaggart is being used in the day and age that we're living in to, again, bring what the Apostle Paul brought out about the message of the cross. And that's the direction and revelation that God gives to an Apostle. All right. The Lord does not govern His church by popular ballot. Aren't you thankful? There's no dominion voting machines. There's no voter fraud. God's kingdom is a theocracy.
Amen? It's not a democracy. It's not a two-thirds or three-fourths vote. Uh, that's not how he governs his church. Paul had been called as such a representative of the Lord Jesus because he had been sent by him as are all apostles. He didn't need someone to vote on whether he was supposed to be an apostle or a preacher uh, uh, spreading the message that God had put upon his heart. All he needed was Christ's calling, and that's all we need. Amen? If we've heard from the Lord, if his ordination is upon our hearts, we need to fulfill what he's called us to do. While the moral law definitely must be kept, Paul maintained that all of this is done in Christ. Right? We are in Christ through the cross. Death to self, denying self, going by way of Calvary, then we can be in Christ. And that's how we keep the moral law. In other words, the believer must simply understand that Jesus kept the law in every respect, even suffering its penalty on our behalf, and our faith in Him, and more particularly, what He did at the cross and in His resurrection, gives us the power to walk clean before the Lord. In effect, keeping the moral laws which is brought about by the help of the Holy Spirit. If we're looking to Jesus, we're looking to the cross, God does not see us as a law breaker anymore. He sees us as a law keeper because we are in Christ. And the Holy Spirit is helping us because our faith is right. He's helping us to do what we could not do in our own willpower, keeping the Ten Commandments, keeping the moral law. And it's not something we wake up every morning saying, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to steal. It's just something that as we express and evidence faith in Jesus Christ, walk in covenant love relationship with Him, the Holy Spirit just works it out naturally in our lives. We don't find ourselves doing what we used to do because the Spirit of God is flowing through us, making us more like Christ. And we become a law keeper because we are like the ultimate law keeper, Jesus Christ. All right? A teacher of the Gentiles. The phrase, a teacher of the Gentiles, in faith and verity, proclaims the function of his calling as an apostle. All right? And not every apostle is going to have the same function, right? Just like every pastor or teacher is not going to have exactly the same function. There's specific things that God speaks to each one of our lives. But for the apostle Paul, God told him he would be a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and and verity. It was always the will of God for the word of God, the word of the Lord, that is salvation to go to the entirety of the world, which of course included all Gentiles. What did the Jews call Gentiles? They called them dogs, right? Very derogatory term. They called them dogs. If you weren't a Jew, you were a dog. You were considered uh, filthy and, and uh, just like a dog eating crumbs off the table. And that's how they viewed Gentiles. But that's not how God viewed Gentiles. He wanted all to be saved from the very beginning. When Jesus came and died on the cross, He came for the entirety of mankind, and He died for all of mankind. Which means that He brought about salvation for the whole of humanity. Again, John 3.16, God so loved the whole world. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, it's going to be in heaven. They're going to be in heaven. And so if we want to be in heaven, we better understand that the salvation God purchased through the blood of Jesus is for all mankind. Faith and truth are the element or sphere in which the apostolic functions are discharged. Okay, there shouldn't be deception. There shouldn't be uh, uh, the, the efforts of man. You shouldn't have to tell somebody that you're an apostle through your business card. Amen? It ought to be evident in your life. And uh, we need faith and truth in the apostles that God is using in these last days. The faith and truth here mentioned centers up in the cross of Christ, which of course centers up in the Word of God. From that springs all the great doctrines of the faith and in every capacity. All right. Verse 8. Prayer. The absolute necessity of prayer on the part of the child of God. Wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves, our prayer life is not to be hindered. Amen. No matter what we're facing in this life, we need to have a strong prayer life, a line of communication 
to God and from God. When we're in prayer, we can talk, yes, and make our petitions known, but we also need to listen in prayer. Let God speak to us, still ourselves, quiet ourselves in our busy schedules, and say, God, I need to hear from you today. I need to tell you the needs, but I also need to hear from you today. Our prayer life cannot be hindered if we're going to be uh, going forward in the things of God. The Christian who is too busy to pray is simply too busy. And that's the excuse that a lot of people use, is that they're too busy. The phrase, lifting up holy hands, has much more to do with a surrendered spirit than it does posture. We need to have our hearts humbled, broken, contrite, trembling at God's word. And that really has more, uh, that's what lifting up holy hands has more to do with than uh, the posture of this, where your hands are when you're lifting them up. The physical act of lifting your hands. The lifting up of the hands signifies surrender to the Lord and admittance as to our helplessness, as well as recognition of His might, of His might that should be, and power, as well as our worship of Him. It's a sign of worship. God, I surrender. I give you my heart. I lay my life completely before you. And that's what God's looking for in our lifting up of holy hands. All right? Without wrath, an angry spirit is the result of frustration, pressure, inability to solve problems, etc. This is the reason for spontaneous shootings. We've seen all of this, haven't we, in the news in recent months and years. Spontaneous shootings, explosions of rage, or all types of problems which are almost unending. An angry spirit. There's a spirit behind all of this. And it's demonic, it's evil. An angry spirit. We as Christians had better be careful that we don't allow an angry spirit to overtake us. Christ is the only answer for an angry spirit. How is Christ the answer to the angry human spirit? When you as a believer begin to understand that the answer for everything which you seek is found in the cross, which of course at the same time presupposes the resurrection of Christ, and that you exhibit a constant faith in this finished work, you will find all types of things changing within your heart and life, including the angry spirit. When you go by way of Calvary, when you're trusting in Jesus, who He is, and you're trusting exclusively in His great sacrifice, His finished work at Calvary, then that angry spirit has to go. Amen? He cannot stay. And Satan won't have a stronghold. He won't have a foothold in your life. And those demonic spirits, those angry spirits that try to influence your thoughts, your actions, they have to go. The great finished work of Christ at the cross is the only answer to the human spirit, and more particularly, to the angry spirit. We want to get rid of an angry spirit that's been tormenting us. We need to go to Jesus. We need to go by way of Calvary. Deny self. Death to self, let Jesus live within us. Doubting, we as believers are not to dispute or doubt the word of God. Alright? We are not to dispute or doubt, but rather to believe. All things are possible to him who doubts. No, to him who disputes. No, but to him who believes. I believe, God, that your word means what it says. And it's going to come to pass just like you said it would. We need to have that kind of faith, that kind of belief. When you place your faith in the finished work of Christ, depending totally upon that, as stated, the disputings and the doubting will leave. We can't control a, a, a doubt coming into our minds, right? The thoughts, the enemy bombards us with thoughts all the time. But we can decide whether it stays in our minds. Amen? We can do what... 2 Corinthians 10 says, taking captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If that thought comes, we can't necessarily keep the thought or the doubt or the disputing from coming, but we don't have to dwell on it, right? We don't have to let it build a house in our minds and stay there. We can say, no, you've got to go. You've got to go. Thought, 
you're not in, in obedience to Christ. You're trying to pull me away from the knowledge of Christ, and I'm not going to have dispute or doubt in my mind. I'm going to believe God. I may not understand how it's working out, but God, I'm going to believe God. And so we need to do that. When we place our faith in the finished work of Christ, depending totally upon that, as stated, those doubtings and disputings will leave. The Word of God will become much more clear to you, and the promises of God will become much more real when we get rid of doubt, we get rid of the disputings regarding God's Word, and we just simply believe. We take God at His Word. We'll understand His will. We'll, un we'll understand His promises. They'll become real to us. The reason is simple. You are now functioning properly as a child of God, and that is in Christ. We need to be in Christ. With proper faith, the Holy Spirit can do more for us in a few minutes than we can do in a lifetime. It's not our efforts. It's not the work of our own hands that's going to get the job done. It's a surrendered life. Amen? It's a yielded spirit. It's a submitted heart to Jesus Christ. A submitted heart to the power of His Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth that's going to help us become the people of God that He wants us to be. Worshiping Him, not just three fast songs and two slow songs on Sunday or Wednesday, but worshiping Him in our lifestyle. Every day, God, You're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my worship. You're worthy of a life lived for You. That's true worship. Not just uh, uh, 20 minutes on Sunday or Wednesday, but really worshiping the Lord. An uh, 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 attitude of our heart that we love Him, and that we are going to live for Him and please Him with our lives. We're going to stop there tonight.